Professor Jennifer McKean uh, lecture. Uh, she's professor at the University of Californ uh, California, and she will speak about forensic fictions, the ongoing epistemic challenges of forensic science as legal evidence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we get the slides showing as well? Perfect. Terrific. Uh, so first of all, I just want to express my great pleasure at being here and the chance to talk to all of you, and Dippy included. Uh, it's, my, uh, it's my honor to be here, and uh, I want to thank the organizers for creating such an impressive uh, week uh, for this uh, first Michele Charufo Girona Evidence Week. I think it's really just marvelous. No puedo hablar castellano muy bien, pero yo quiero decir... I cannot speak Spanish very well, but I do want to thank the organizer in Spanish. Uh, I speak a little bit, but anyway, I'm going to switch to Spanish. Uh, so I'm going to speak today about uh, forensic science and some of the ongoing challenges with respect to forensic science pattern evidence. Um, my talk comes from uh, an American perspective, because that's what I know best, uh, but I hope that there'll be some chance during the discussion to broaden this set of engagements uh, uh, more globally, um, because some of the particular challenges we face in the United States are a function of the dynamics of our adversarial process, but not all. And so I look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas. This audience, I think most of you probably know some of the broad history of uh, forensic science and the challenges with pattern evidence in the American courtroom. So I am not going to spend a great deal of time talking about those. Uh, I'm going to breeze through those and then talk about what are some of the ongoing uh, knowledge-based challenges, uh, foundational fictions, as I call them, in this space. So we have, first of all, a very long history of use of pattern evidence, um, going back to the turn of the century, really. And interestingly, uh, there were literary notions of using patterns to identify people before we actually used patterns in real cases. So Pudding Head Wilson, 1893, uh, novella by Mark Twain, relies in part on the idea of a fingerprint match, doing a great deal of work in the novel, before we began to see pattern evidence evidence being used in actual trials, uh, like the Jennings case in 1911 as one very early example. Importantly, and again I believe this is probably familiar to most of you here, these pattern evidence uh, techniques were developed by law enforcement and developed for law enforcement. They did not emerge through uh, foundations in university or university science. And that's an important dimension to understand for some of the ongoing problems today. A few of these images just show you some of the early labs, the early FBI lab, and then uh, the early gun lab at the, uh, affiliated with, with uh, Northwestern. Uh, and then in the bottom corner is, is the LA County crime lab of today. Uh, uh, and so these techniques were developed by law enforcement and for law enforcement, and was largely business as usual over many decades where new techniques were uh, developed and used in the courtroom without a lot of scrutiny until a pair of changes that ended up having some effect on pattern evidence. One was the rise of DNA evidence, including a set of legal admissibility challenges in the United States, which led to increased focus on the problem of technology transfer into the courtroom and some of the questions about validity and reliability. And then also the rise of Daubert and the notion of the judge as gatekeeper with some degree of responsibility to assess validity and reliability. For those who were listening to Ron Allen earlier today, Ron opined that Daubert was not, in fact, a heightened admissibility standard. I, I think he's both right and wrong. I agree with Ron Allen that the Daubert opinion contains language that suggests that it's actually in some ways meant to broaden the kinds of things that courts can look at. 
rather than having a rigid general acceptance standard. But it also drew attention to this issue of validity and reliability. And Daubert provided a multi-factor test for the courts to use, which in essence gave judges the power to engage in more intensive gatekeeping if they wanted to, or they could do vaguely gestural, pretty weak gatekeeping under Daubert if they preferred. So the Daubert test itself didn't really answer the question of whether it was more or less uh, uh, intensive, in my opinion. It gave a set of criteria that really ended up giving more power to trial judges. And in practice, what we've seen is that on the civil side, I think Daubert has led to somewhat greater scrutiny. But on the criminal law side, it really hasn't, not much. And that's part of this broader story. Uh, in 2009, a very important report was issued by the National Academy of Sciences about what was happening in pattern evidence and forensic science. And this report, which has often been called a blockbuster, it's been viewed as a, a signal event in this, in this story, came out and basically said that the forensic sciences really didn't have enough science behind them. And that they couldn't, that, with, that, that, that these forms of pattern evidence couldn't actually uh, legitimately offer uh, source identification, that they couldn't demonstrate a connection between evidence and a specific individual or source, that they couldn't individualize. Now, up until now, I think this, this story has been relatively familiar to most of you here. Um, this is just a bit of an introduction for those who might not be quite so familiar with, with this moment up until 2009. What I want to do in this talk is look at what's happened since and the basic reality that not that much has changed since the issu issuance of this blockbuster report that was supposed to have a transformative effect on how we used pattern evidence. Now this happened in 2009, and for your amusement, I thought I would describe some of the things that have happened since 2009. The invention of the iPad, the rise of Uber, Venmo, the consumer LED light bulb, and the use of biometrics in ordinary people's lives, both through eye touch on phones using fingerprints and now face identification that many of us regularly use every time we, we, we make use of our phones. So we've seen lots of transformations since 2009. And yet with respect to forensic pattern identification, there just hasn't been that much change. That's something of an overstatement. One could tell the story focusing on what has changed, but if you, if you look at the American courtroom and the way pattern evidence is used today compared to the way it was used prior to 2009, you don't see it, or I don't see it, as being terribly transformative. Fundamentally, most of the things that were allowed before 2009 continue to take place. And the, the paradigm shift that some saw coming in this space really has yet to fully take hold. And so what I want to do together is look at some of the reasons for that and look at some of the ways that pattern evidence, uh, that there are a set of foundational fictions, a set of beliefs, a set of epistemic claims that continue to have ongoing power and prevent uh, real or dramatic change from taking place in this space. Overall, in the years following 2009, there has been some gestural responses. In fact, many courts comment on the surprising lack of scientific study of these forms of pattern evidence, but still, most of the time, they find these kinds of evidence to be valid and reliable enough to continue to use in court. They have, in many cases, required some very modest changes to the language used by experts, and I will be coming back to that. There are, to be sure, some areas where we have seen more transformation, and the two I would point to in particular are microscopic hair identification and bite mark identification. Now, uh, largely not much used. But overall, 13 years after this blockbuster report, and mostly we continue to see forensic science being used in pretty similar ways. 
So why? Why are there uh, ongoing uses without transformation? Why is it that scientists comes together and looks at forensic science, they find really big areas of concern, and yet we don't see much change? And then also, why should we care? One of the main reasons we should care is for the, the sort of thoughtful use of evidence and uh, theoretically legitimate uses of evidence in court. We should also care because from a practical level, faulty forensic science is one of the contributing causes to wrongful convictions. In fact, in around not quite 50% of the known wrongful convictions based on DNA exonerations, those cases reveal uh, one of the of the contributing causes being uh, faulty use of forensic science or overstated claims or unvalidated or improper forensic science. So there's pretty significant real world implications to this as well as conceptual and theoretical reasons to care. So what are the beliefs and assumptions that help explain why we have seen such modest change? Never mind that it's been a dozen years, and never mind that even after the NAS report, there have been further efforts by very well-regarded scientists to say, wait a minute, we're using in court forms of evidence that really don't have the kinds of validation supporting them that we would want or expect. What are the lingering beliefs that define the reception to and the reaction to pattern evidence in court? And where are we seeing glimmers of epistemic change and perhaps some reason for some degree of hope? That's what I'm going to focus on in our remaining time together. So what I want to do now is go through about a dozen persistent foundational fictions in this space. These are belief sets that remain widespread, in some cases, by judges, in some cases by the practicing forensic science, scientists themselves. And some of them I'm going to run through very quickly and some of them I'll spend a little bit more time on. But my goal is to sort of run through a dozen of these persistent belief sets that help explain why there hasn't been more transformation. The first is the idea that experience is a source of epistemic authority that because a practicing forensic scientist has done so for a while, that that provides a legitimate source of knowledge saying that they can do what they say that they can do. Now in ordinary life, there's many instances where we do view experience as a legitimate source of, of informal epistemic authority. That we'd rather have you know, an experienced plumber than a beginner plumber, or an experienced physician rather than a beginner physician. So I don't mean to say that experience can never be a, a legitimate source of epistemic authority. But in the forensic science space, there's a remarkable lack of feedback mechanism to let experts know whether they're doing what they're doing correctly or not. They don't really know. We don't, have, we don't know ground truth. And because they have a lot of authority in the courtroom, the fact that their evidence helps to produce convictions doesn't necessarily tell us that they got it right. And so unless experience is tested against, uh, against mechanisms that would provide feedback to produce knowledge of error, it shouldn't really be a source of too much epistemic authority. We can see sort of silly examples that help illustrate this point. If you had a, 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 a tarot card reader or somebody who was a psychic, the fact that they had a great deal of experience, the fact that they'd been, been being a psychic for 25 years might not lead you to believe that they really knew what they were doing. So experience standing alone ought not to be a source of epistemic authority unless we can be confident that there's some kind of feedback mechanism that would lead people to have a recognition and an understanding of the existence of error. That feedback mechanism is largely absent, and yet over and over again, courts continue to find experience as a reason to permit the introduction of experts in pattern evidence. So that's one persistent foundational fiction. 
This has been recognized by others, to be sure. In fact, uh, a, a later report the, by, by a set of presidential science advisors uh, names this explicitly and uh, tells courts that they ought not to focus on experience as a legitimate form of knowledge. But courts continue to do so. I could, I could give you opinions just from even the last year where judges continue to, to, to view experience as a reason to admit this evidence. A second foundational fiction relates to bias. That cognitive bias, although gestured to, is not viewed by courts or forensic practitioners as a significant enough problem to require design change as a prelude to admissibility. What do I mean? If experts are making use of processes and procedures that do not protect them from the risk of cognitive bias, courts nonetheless continue to admit those experts in court. Practically speaking, in many instances, forensic scientists are given access to information about the case that goes well beyond that which they need in order to uh, do their analysis. They might know, for example, that there's a great deal of other evidence pointing to this suspect, even though knowing that has the potential to create some degree of contextual bias for their examination of the material at issue. Conversely, they might know there's very little other evidence, which might lead them to understand that if they can't make a match, the case won't move forward. There's no reason they need these kinds of, of information in order to do their uh, particularized form of pattern identification. Some laboratories have put into place procedures to protect examiners from this kind of external information. But at least in the United States, that remains a minority approach. Most labs do not provide those kinds of protections. And yet, judges sometimes gesture to this issue, but largely say that because the forensic scientist is experienced and asserts that they aren't biased, that that's enough. And this is, I think, another persistent foundational fiction. It simply wouldn't be that difficult in most instances to create processes that would create these kinds of protections. But unless the courts insist upon it, laboratories don't have a lot of incentive to do so because it's A, at the margins more costly, and B, might reduce the sense that the forensic expert and the forensic scientist is on the same team as law enforcement in general, which might be good for science, but bad for the sense of teamwork that might produce the results they're seeking. So that's a second foundational fiction. A third is the idea that cross-examination is a functional and effective mechanism for determining accuracy and truth for uh, forensic pattern evidence in particular, and also as a more general matter. The Daubert opinion had strong language to this effect, that cross-examination was the method by which um, shaky but admissible evidence should be tested. And of course, this is a foundational fiction of the adversarial legal system writ large, the idea that cross-examination is a, an effective mechanism for ferreting out truth is more ideal than probably reality. Certainly with respect to forms of expert evidence, like pattern evidence, there's little reason to believe that cross-examination is a terribly effective mechanism by which ju juries can come to understand uh, the degree of appropriate weight and validity to give such evidence. And yet judges, say over and over again that they'll admit this evidence for what it's worth and let it be, uh, let, let the weight be assessed via cross-examination. I will add as a side note that some courts do something even worse than this, which is that they not only admit the evidence, but then they actually curtail the, the use of counter expertise by the, the defendant. Um, many of the counter experts used in the forensic science space are not themselves forensic practitioners because forensic practitioners are a relatively closed guild where, for example, it's not likely to be the, the, uh, the firearms expert who's going to critique the methodology of firearms examination. And some courts 
counter experts who are experts in scientific methodology saying that they aren't uh, relevant to the uh, inquiry. So then they're both permitting cross-examination and then not even allowing an additional form of knowledge that could make uh, the adversarial process operate more effectively. So that's a third persistent foundational fiction that I want to draw to your attention. The fourth is the power of precedent and the power of precedential thinking that does a great deal of work with judges. And thus far, most of these that I'm describing, it's really as much foundational fictions for the judges trying to assess this evidence as it is for the practitioners. We've been using a number of these techniques for a long time. And uh, this contributes to a kind of grandfathering phenomenon where courts are very reluctant to exclude or in many cases even limit a kind of evidence that has a substantial history. Many trial courts uh, are aiming not to be overturned on appeal, they're aiming not to draw attention to themselves, and to evidence that has been long allowed can feel like the safe and conservative thing to do. This can be true even if there's new information suggesting that there's reasons to doubt the legitimacy and validity of the form of evidence. The power of precedent means that many courts, again, will gesture, they'll express surprise that there hasn't been more scientific validation, but they'll say, well, a lot of other courts have already admitted this, and so they will as well. And so it can be very hard to get uh, courts to thoughtfully open uh, the, the, the black box, so to speak, of that which they've done before or that which their brethren and their, 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 their judicial siblings have already done. And instead, they'll just use precedent as a reason to continue to operate in the same way. The f these four are, I think, relatively familiar. The fifth might be a little bit more, uh, that, that has received a little bit less attention. One of the dynamics of pattern evidence is that it's often what I've called elsewhere semi-legible. That is to say, it has the quality of being partly interpretable by lay viewers and partly requiring expertise in order to assess and make sense of that which you are seeing. And I think that this semi-legibility, this quality that many kinds of forensic science have, things like fingerprints, firearms identification, handwriting evidence, blood spatter evidence, uh, and others, this quality of semi-legibility, I think leads courts to err on the side of admission because they say to themselves, this isn't rocket science, this isn't complicated statistics, this isn't naked statistical evidence. This is something that the judge can sort of make sense of and see, and so can the fact finder. And so this semi-legible aspect leads courts to uh, err on the side of inclusion, even when there isn't as much scientific validation as we wish we had, in part because the judge, too, thinks that she or he can see the value of the evidence for him or herself. There is something to this. I don't want to say this is completely wrong or false. I'm going to give you a couple of examples showing you images of the kinds of things we're talking about. So for example, this is an image of three different kinds of fingerprint patterns. I don't know if any of you in this room are trained fingerprint experts. I am not. And yet any of us could look at these and assert with a relatively high degree of confidence that they did not come from the same finger. The patterns are substantially different from one another. And we know enough about variation in prints and the way that, that friction ridge works just as, as lay people without expertise to be able to look at these images and assert that they do not come from the same person. These are relatively legible to all of us, even without a lot of expertise. And so if, this is, if these images were relevant in court, you can begin to understand why a, a, a judge thinking about their admissibility 
might think that even if there wasn't in fact an adequate statistical model underlying fingerprint evidence, even if there was a great deal of subjectivity in the method that experts use, even if uh, there was no um, uh, you know, cl clear probabilistic information that could be provided, this provides valuable information that a lay fact finder could make sense of. So this is an example of semi-legibility, or even actually relatively legible images. On the other hand, often in actual casework, the images may be substantially less legible than that. I'm showing you here another set of fingerprints that come from a very famous fingerprint case, in part because it's a case where even a number of experts made a mistake. And this mistake actually led to uh, more self-reflection and critique in the fingerprint community. Here, in the center, you have an image that was uh, found on material linked to a terrorist act in Madrid. And on each side, you have a print that actually don't come from the same individual Although you can see, again, they're semi-legible, but what I expect that you see if you look closely is prints that look extraordinarily similar to one another. In this instance, so similar that even experts made an erroneous determination about the identification. But the point is to sort of show you that just because the simple versions are really quite legible, that doesn't necessarily mean that the materials that are relevant in legal cases are equally legible. But at the same time, I want you to see that they are semi-legible, right? You can see that there's a relatively high degree of similarity. Is it enough similarity to assert that it comes from the same individual? I don't have the expertise to make that determination. Neither do most of you. Truth be told, neither do fingerprint experts, but that's a different story. But I want you to have a sense of sort of this semi-legibility and the way that this see-it-for-yourself quality helps to uh, produce a dynamic that leads courts to be very reluctant to exclude. This isn't just fingerprints. By the way, this is the, the, the prints that I just showed you, uh, just to give you a little bit of context. One of them came from Brandon Mayfield, the gentleman on your left. The, uh, the other one came from Unani Daoud, uh, a known uh, terrorist. Brandon Mayfield was held as a material witness on the basis of, of uh, what of, of one of those two fingerprints. Uh, later, it was determined that that was an erroneous match and he was released and the fingerprint was later identified as belonging to Dilud. These are the prints again and just now they're identified um, as with those to whom they belong. This is another example of semi-legible evidence. Uh, these are images um, from a, a firearms case. Uh, this is sort of microscopy showing cartridge cases. And um, uh, a public defender did a little interesting experiment where she showed that with 15 minutes of work, she could train a set of lay people well enough that at least with some of these examples, they wouldn't make false positive identifications, that they could be taught to, uh, to partially see and understand that which they were looking at. Though, of course, that doesn't answer whether they could do it with a high degree of accuracy or in very difficult cases. But again, you can see that these are visual patterns that your brain begins to try to make sense of, and they are semi-legible to you to some degree. And I believe that this semi-legibility is part of why courts have been so reluctant to engage in more uh, substantial and thorough gatekeeping activities. Moving on uh, to additional foundational fictions, this is the sixth that I want to describe to you today. Uh, there's a claim, and now this, the, uh, up until now, these have focused more on, on foundational fictions that are influencing judges. This one, I think, is more at work for practitioners themselves. And that is that blind proficiency testing, efforts to test whether forensic practitioners can do what they claim to do accurately, is very hard to design, or at least impractical. 
Uh, there have been some efforts, many of these fields have a form of proficiency testing, but that form takes place in settings where the examiners know that they're being tested. It's test day, it's time to be proficiency tested. There's also a concern that many of these proficiency tests are unreasonably easy. And so many critics, many academic critics have suggested that it would be much better if proficiency testing happened through the ordinary course of the workplace where instead of knowing that they were being tested, they were, thought they were just doing casework, and every so often in the course of doing casework, they would be tested with, uh, with, with an exemplar where ground truth was known for the purposes of seeing how they did. Many, many practitioners have asserted that this just can't be done. And the, the little chart I'm including here comes from a recent article uh, that, that took place after a set of, uh, after an effort to bring a set of stakeholders together to explore what might make blind testing more feasible. And these were some of the perceived challenges. I'm not going to go through all of them. I've listed them here. I will say that the Houston Crime Lab has begun to uh, use stream of casework testing as an effort to do blind proficiency testing in their work, showing that it is not, in fact, impossible, although it is relatively costly. They obviously have to put some, some resources uh, into, into that project. And so uh, the practitioner community has often said that either it can't be done or that it would just be too expensive. Uh, but at least Houston, the evidence from Houston suggests otherwise. Uh, a seventh foundational fiction relates to how error is understood. There is a conception in the forensic science community that to do their, if they do what they're doing well, they shouldn't make any mistakes. And when you have that as a, as a, as a notion, any, the, 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 the corollary is that any error means that the practitioner in question was incompetent or inadequate. And that makes errors terrifying. It also makes difficult proficiency testing extremely terrifying too, right? Because if you try to do proficiency testing that matches the degree of difficulty that you might encounter in difficult casework, uh, if any error means that you might be, be fired or ousted or viewed in, as inadequate, that can be quite threatening. There's a culture, there's a long-standing culture that says that these methods, if used properly, should be 100% correct. That's, of course, you know, a form of nonsense, right? I mean, that cannot possibly be, be, be the way we ought to think about it, nor true. But there is a real problem when you combine that culture with adversarialism. That is to say, if we go back to cross-examination, uh, if, if, if an examiner has made a mistake and that mistake is known, or has made multiple, mista multiple mistakes and those mistakes are known, they're handing the defense a really lovely issue on cross-examination where they can ask about whether the examiner's ever made mistakes. The inference, of course, being that if they've made mistakes in the past, then they might well have made mistakes in the case in question, too. When you have a culture where we have no known error rates, where we have no real sense of the frequency of errors, or of the contributing causes to these errors, then all errors become equal, right? And so any error in the past becomes incredibly threatening. So this is a really dysfunctional dynamic in pattern evidence today, because it leads to practitioners being very wary of any kinds of research enterprise that's going to bring their errors to the surface in a, in a, in a more known way. Because when you combine that with adversarialism, it threatens to being quite delegitimating. I don't know that there's a sort of simple way out of this, although if we could make uh, profi blind proficiency tests much more regular, if we could do much more scientific research into the frequency of errors, if we could do black box error rate studies that got us known uh, rates of error that we could, we could make sense of, we also might be able to create a culture that says, uh, with some of these forms of knowledge, that no, they're not perfect, but they are very good, and yes, errors are occasionally made, but now we can quantify 
identify them and, and give some sense of their frequency, or we can have better knowledge about the degree of difficulty of different kinds of examinations and therefore have a, a, a eventually even a probabilistic way to determine uh, what are the odds, you know, some kind of likelihood ratio or some kind of more quantitative form of assessment of the particular match. That leads me to the eighth foundational fiction, which is in parts of the practitioner community, there is an ongoing reluctance to think probabilistically about pattern evidence. This is changing, at least at the margins. I think uh, back when in 2009 when that NAS report came out, the vast, vast majority of practitioners, even those at leading forensic science institutions in the United States, rejected the idea that they were engaged in a probabilistic enterprise. They asserted that uh, when they made a match, it was not a probability, it was a certainty that they were making a match to the exclusion of all other potential such matches, at least in some areas, not in all, and that they weren't making some kind of uh, assessment of the, the likelihood that with this degree of similarity, uh, this was likely to come from the same source, but rather they were making uh, a leap of faith, certain conclusion. Among the leaders in many of these forensic uh, domains, there is now at least a conceptual recognition that the task at hand is a probabilistic one. So there's at least an acknowledgement that, that theoretically what they are doing is making some kind of probabilistic assessment rather than an absolute one. But in rank and file forensic scientists, you still see an ongoing reluctance in many instances to acknowledge that this is even conceptually probabilistic. Part of that reluctance is because it's a probabilistic enterprise that continues to lack actual probabilities. And so once you've acknowledged that it's probabilistic, that shows up the oddness that you actually have no mechanism by which to, to quantify that probabilistic determination. It's, it's subjectively probabilistic. Now that's not a problem for you know, any of the, the Bayesians in the room, but there's no way to uh, provide um, a, a quantitative assessment in most of, most of these fields of something like a likelihood ratio or something like what we have with a random match probability in DNA. There isn't a kind of statistical model that we currently have that permits that. And that leads to, uh, to a kind of ninth foundational fiction, which is almost the inverse of the eighth. The eighth is a reluctance to sort of admit that it's probabilistic. The ninth is to say, okay, okay, we now acknowledge that it's probabilistic, and so by acknowledging it, we've gone far enough. Now we've solved the problem, as long as we're willing to say that it's at least theoretically probabilistic then there really isn't a uh, difficulty here. And uh, as long as we say that it's probabilistic and thus there is some residual uncertainty, now we've solved the problem of how to testify. I think that's wrong, and I'll describe briefly why. Take firearms identification testimony, an area where this has become um, quite true. First, the good. In 2020, the Department of Justice issued uniform language about testimony and reporting. This is guidance for what uh, examiners should do. And a set of old practices listed here were thrown out the window. It used to be that examiners would testify that they were had 100% certainty, or reasonable scientific certainty, whatever that means, nobody really can define it. They used to testify that there was a zero error rate, they used to testify that they could match uh, a casing to a particular gun based on uniqueness, and that that identification meant the exclusion of all others. Now, in this 2020 report, all of those forms of testimony are prohibited. Experts are no longer supposed to say any of those things. And explicitly, those are viewed as not legitimate. That might seem like progress, but here's what is allowed. They still allow source identification. They still allow an examiner to uh, link a particular firearm to a particular uh, bullet casing. Now they say that a source identification 
is a statement of an examiner's opinion that the probability that two tool marks were made by different sources is so small that it's negligible based on the blend of both class characteristics and individual characteristics. So they no longer allow source identification based on uniqueness. They no longer allow an examiner to say that they've excluded all other sources. Instead, what they allow is the examiner to say, based on my experience, remember back number one, that foundational fiction number one was to view experience as epistemically legitimate. Based on my extensive experience, I would never expect to see this much similarity in class characteristics plus individualizing characteristics unless these two uh, items came from the same source. And so the probability that they didn't is so small that it's negligible. I don't think that's very much progress. I don't think a fact finder or juror hears that very differently. I think what they hear is the expert saying, these two things share a source. Yes, they've now inserted words like probability and negligible probability and opinion. But at the end of the day, they're still hearing an incredibly strong claim of a source identification, uh, even though they're, they, they, they've, they've thrown out some magic keywords that used to be allowed. There are some people out there who think that this is a very important transformation because now we're acknowledging that it's probabilistic and now we're acknowledging that it's the expert's opinion. But I don't think, uh, I, 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 I get that conceptually it's a minor difference and we've thrown out some really extreme language, but in practical terms, I think what's still being permitted is almost identical. And from a practical uh, perspective of what the jury's likely to make sense of and hear is really a distinction without any difference at all. These modest language shifts uh, have become fairly common. And so some of the outrageous forms of overstatement have been judicially excluded. And there are many judicial opinions restricting testimony in these ways. But I don't think uh, it really makes very much practical difference on the ground unless you start to restrict the testimony a great deal more than what I've just described. And what I've just described in a set of areas, especially firearms and fingerprints, is what's become relatively commonplace. A tenth foundational uh, fiction is a set of cases that go somewhat further than what I've just described and treat it as if it's an answer to our problems. In a handful of cases, and this is not dominant, but this is about the most extreme form of, of transformative opinion by the courts, we see some judges going further than, not even allowing the language I just described uh, about, um, that's still making a source identification, but instead allowing only language like you cannot exclude this as being a possible match allowing testimony that what they see is consistent with the possibility of a match, or that there are class characteristics in common, and hence it cannot be excluded as a possible source. This is different. I want to be very clear that this is a more restricted form of testimony. This is prohibiting a source identification. It's prohibiting the expert from using language that suggests that this item came from a particular source, that this fingerprint matches to this finger, or that this casing matches to this, uh, to this particular gun. This is a much more restrictive form of testimony. And we are beginning to see a handful of courts going down this path. In a recent opinion, U.S. versus Tibbs, a D.C. Superior Court judge wrote a really marvelous opinion about firearms testimony. I honestly think it's perhaps the single most thoughtful opinion that's out there in pattern evidence. Interestingly, he was a former public defender. Uh, he also spent a couple of years as, an, as a law professor. Uh, and I'm not saying that either of these things are causally connected to the, 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 the thoughtfulness of the opinion, but it's an opinion that really opens up the black box of looking at firearms evidence um, and doesn't just say uh, it's been admitted lots of times before, but instead really tries to look at the degree to which there's scientific validity to support the claims being made by experts. 
And Tibbs does some really interesting things. First of all, it rejects source attribution. Tibbs does not allow the expert to testify that the, uh, to, to knowledge uh, that would link uh, a particular bullet uh, casing to a particular gun. And there's two really wonderful aspects of the opinion that I will mention briefly. One is that it shows a pretty sophisticated understanding of peer review. Peer review is one of the Daubert factors. Daubert provides a, a set of factors, and courts can kind of pick and choose about what to look at, but one of them is whether uh, the, the, the issue in question has been peer reviewed. With firearms testimony in particular, there's a great many studies that have appeared in a journal that is kind of limited only to the firearms community. Their peer review, such as it is, has traditionally been open. That is to say, uh, the reviewer knows who the author is, the author knows who the reviewer is. There's no blindness in any way. They are beginning to change that now, but traditionally until very, very recently, that was how they operated. They also only used the community of firearms examiners as potential peer reviewers. And this journal is actually really hard to find. You can't find it in most university libraries. It's not indexed by any of the major methods by which knowledge is produced or transmitted. You really had to be a member of the American Firearms and Toolmarks uh, group in order to get access to it at all. Many courts nonetheless say, oh look, it appeared somewhere in print, therefore it's peer reviewed. And uh, Judge Edelman uh, did a much more sophisticated look at what peer review should mean and found that uh, this form of peer review really wasn't adequate. He also critiques appropriately, um, some courts have found that it counts as peer review if somebody out there criticized the study, even if, it, if that's all that happened. Uh, and that's a little bit odd, right? If, if, if you publish something and then somebody else, like the PCAST report, says that your study is poorly done, there are courts who say, oh, well, look, somebody wrote about it, therefore that's peer review. And Edelman, I think, does a much more thoughtful um, understanding of what peer review is supposed to do and how it works. He also has, I think, the most sophisticated understanding of the process of inconclusive determinations in forensic science, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. But for the moment, what I want to focus on is that his opinion really does restrict the testimony quite meaningfully. He only lets the experts testify about class characteristics, about general characteristics associated with this kind of firearm, um, and therefore provide nothing more than cannot be excluded. The problem is, in my view, that trades a validity and reliability problem for a relevance one. I think it's fair to say that, uh, that if you testify only about class characteristics, <clears throat> there isn't um, a, a terribly substantial validity problem. There's relatively good evidence that different kinds of firearms do have some class characteristics which uh, we, can, we can know about and discuss. The problem is that unless we can associate some kind of quantitative uh, determination with that cannot exclude, it becomes almost meaningless. We allow into, this in a way is a version of the naked statistical evidence problem. Um, we allow in evidence all the time uh, forms of proof that invite the fact finder to make some kind of statistical inference, right? I have red hair. A few others of you in this room do as well, but not all that many. If I asked you to make a, a quantitative assessment of the frequency of redheads, you have some empirical basis for making that judgment. Perhaps if you were here from Ireland, your lay empirical assessment might be rather different than if you're here from uh, a, a different country, if you're here from Spain, right? Your sort of lay quantitative assessment of the frequency with which there's a particular hair color might be uh, affected by your, uh, your experience of the world. But still, you have some basis for making some assessment. And so if I come and testify that a redhead committed a particular act, you have some way of assessing how much discriminability that provides in the universe. An expert who comes and testifies that this set of class characteristics means that this particular gun cannot be excluded, how do you know anything about the frequency there? How do you have any way of assessing whether uh, that gives you a relatively small universe of potential exemplars that might fit, or a very, very large one. 
And if your lay experience does not give you any basis for making that judgment, and if the expert also cannot give you any quantitative basis for making that judgment, I think there's an argument that actually that evidence needs to be excluded as misleading because it literally has no relevance that you can get your, your head around, right? There's no way for you to give it any sort of um, soft quantitative meaning if you don't have an experience base that provides it and neither can the expert. And so I don't think a lay fact finder can um, intelligently make use of that information if we cannot provide any degree of of uh, quantitative uh, clarity or assessment, and if ordinary experience does not provide it either. And so I, I admire the group of judges like Edelman who are trying to do something more dramatic, but I also have a significant concern that in fact it's, uh, it's trading a, a validity problem and turning it into a relevance problem. Almost done now, but two more foundational fictions. The 11th is something that Edelman was quite sophisticated about, and that's about how we think about inconclusive determinations. In most forms of pattern evidence, experts can reach one of three conclusions. They can either find that they believe, in their opinion, that two items come from a common source. They can find that this exemplar is excluded from having come from the source in question or they can have a kind of, I don't know, inconclusive, not enough information, cannot reach a decision. In many of the efforts to study pattern evidence, which have emerged, and there have been some over the last 13 years, inconclusives are not seen to be errors. When we look at error rates, many of the studies look only at false positives and false negatives. And if the examiner said that they couldn't reach a conclusion, that is not treated as a mistake. Is that how it should be? I think it depends. In some instances, it might be that inconclusive is the right answer. That is to say, if we knew what quantum of information we needed to reach a source identification, and that quantum of information was lacking because the fingerprint was too smudged or there wasn't enough information, the right answer might be, we cannot say. And so sometimes, even though of course there's a ground truth, at the end of the day, two things either do share a source or don't, it might be that in some instances, the conclusion of, inconclu of inconclusive is the epistemically correct one based on the information that we have. However, at the same time, if there is enough information for a competent examiner to reach a conclusion, then saying I don't know might be the wrong answer. Think about a standardized test and a multiple choice test and the math problems that get too hard. When the math problems get too hard for me, my answer might be, I don't know. Ron Allen might have stronger math skills than I, and so he could get the right answer. Surely when you're grading my exam, you shouldn't just give me a pass on the I don't knows if somebody with better math skills would have been able to get those answers correct, right? My I don't know would be a wrong answer. In some of the, the efforts to test forensic examiners, many of them say inconclusive in many instances. And to simply say that those have no bearing on the error rate is to invite them, especially when they're engaged in exercises that they know are for the purposes of determining error rate, anytime it's at all difficult to simply conclude that it's inconclusive because that lets them punt. That lets them exclude that from the rate at which we're looking at their correct and incorrect decisions. And so this is a tricky problem because if we can't know whether or not this is an instance in which examiners ought to be able to reach a conclusion, we shouldn't simply assume that because they couldn't reach a conclusion that that was the right answer. In fact, in some of the studies that have begun to, begin, to, begin to look at how well examiners do this, 
Examiners have been involved in selecting the exemplars and have concluded that these are all reasonable tests. That is to say that in those examiners' opinion, nobody should be reaching inconclusive answers. And so certainly we shouldn't simply ignore inconclusives in our assessment of what counts as an error. And Edelman, in the Tibbs opinion, recognized this problem, and he was the first judge to really recognize this thoughtfully. And so I think that's sort of impressive. But there's a general foundational fiction that inconclusive, inconclusive determinations should just be seen as outside the space of error. Finally, the last foundational fiction that I'll make mention of is the idea that admissibility determinations and judicial assessments of validity are a way that we're going to see change in this area. I used to think that this was true. I used to think that judges would begin to take their gatekeeping responsibilities more seriously, that they would take the reports of scientists of the problems here uh, as being significant enough and deep enough that they would take a thoughtful and careful look. But I've come to think that that's happening only very, very rarely that what we've seen instead are tremendously superficial shifts, like the language changes that I've referred to, and that even the very most dramatic opinions, like uh, Judge Edelman and Tibbs, don't really go that far. And so I've become pretty skeptical that the courts are going to be a mechanism, at least in the United States context, by which we're going to see significant change. And the problem is that the courts aren't insisting on change, the forensic practitioners aren't likely to be that supportive of it either. After all, if the courts continue to admit their evidence, they don't have a lot of incentives to go do the forms of research that would at best show that they're almost as good as they're currently saying that they are. And so is there any hope? I don't know. That's my honest answer. I'm not sure. I do think we've seen some change in practitioner culture. I think there's the possibility of forensic science commissions and some extra, le some extra legal system spaces to provoke shifts. Ongoing pressure from the scientific community, not the, sci not the forensic scientists, but broader scientific community, has made some difference. Both the report, the NAS report, and the, and the President's Council of Advisors report on science and technology have made a modest amount of difference. There was, for a brief period, a National Commission on Forensic Science. I confess I was pretty skeptical about whether that would achieve anything, but it did more than I thought it might. It then got disbanded in the early part of the Trump administration and has not come back. I do think popular culture representations, podcasts and true crime shows and the like that show some of the problems with forensic science are creating a broad, broader cultural understanding of the weaknesses of some of these areas. And perhaps I'm being too cynical and too negative, and perhaps we will see more judges like Edelman along the way who are prepared to take uh, braver stances with respect to these kinds of evidence. And so with that, I conclude, and I'm happy, very, very interested in hearing your thoughts and reactions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mugrin. Now we start with, with us some questions. Uh, the first speaker to ask for the question is Janaina, Janaina Machida. Where are you? Good morning, good afternoon, I don't know. For your presentation. Uh, just like you, my Spanish is better than my English, so uh, my question will be in Spanish. Um, my question actually is not about the presentation itself, but I think it has to do with your presentation. I would like to talk about the number three fiction that you mentioned that deals with this belief that cross-examination is enough to bring uh, about the truth. 
and that has to do with um, expert testimony but I think it's applicable to testimony based on memory as well so when we talk about eyewitness testimony there are some cases uh, in which they um, have identification uh, and with different suspects and they have to identify and sometimes that doesn't even happen they just show them a picture of a suspect isolated in a very sub suggestive area within the context and Three weeks ago, I read a decision by the Supreme Court of the United States in which uh, Judge Ginsburg, which is one of the judges, uh, justices that I admire the most, um, and in the case Perry versus New Hampshire, uh, she um, admitted it, it is a case that took place in a parking lot and the person who was picked out by the testimony was next to the police officer when he was identified. So that is not objective. And through this opinion, uh, she said that it should be known by the jurors how this identification process took place, being justified um, well, explaining that the police officers didn't have bad motives to conduct the identification this way. But uh, Judge Ginsburg said that jurors should be aware of everything that might question admissibility. And I, found, I find it very interesting to talk about this blind faith in the ability of jurors to convey at the same time uh, to convey that and at the same time I've read texts, texts from people who are here actually um, that say that judges also have these admissibility issues so there's, there's this question of admissibility non-admissibility but I would like to hear more from you on this and the applicability of your ideas on non-expert evidence and if possible I would like to uh, mention something that I found weird. Why this concept of fiction? Why did you use uh, that word? Because maybe it's not a fiction, but rather an error, a mistake. There are uh, thesis, hypotheses that should not be presented or embraced in the court. If we think about legal fictions by Alan Fuller, uh, there are there are propositions of facts that are known to be false but are then incorporated because they will lead to a fairer a more fair result that means that at the end of the day they will correct but in this case i think that what you presented were just errors so maybe instead we could talk about dogmas dogmas that we should demystify so maybe a technical question and a comment uh, from yourself on, in terms of this concept. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the, the comments and the question. Um, broadly speaking, when we think about um, eyewitness identification and the methods by which the courts um, regulate or really don't much regulate admissibility, uh, I, I agree with you. There's much to be said about that. Um, Show-ups of the kind in Perry versus New Hampshire are, are uh, disfavored, but at the same time, courts allow them because sometimes that's just what happened in the, the story of, of the occurrences, and they're very, very reluctant to exclude. Um, so we've seen some progress, actually, in terms of um, lineup techniques in the U.S. Where, where there is more attention to mechanisms like blinding the person doing the lineup so that they don't know which is the suspect and uh, efforts to record the, the lineup procedure so that there can be understanding of, it, of what occurred later and also uh, mechanisms to do things like um, ask the witness uh, for their confidence judgment at the time rather than later because there's evidence to suggest that even though confidence and accuracy are not very uh, linked at all, they're even less linked when time has passed. So I think it's an area where we have seen some um, 
some incorporation of some of the insights in, uh, from psychology into legal practice, but you're right that the courts continue to permit uh, a great many um, forms of identification evidence, even when, when they don't comport with uh, better practice, and then they tend to use similar logics like, well, we can, we can, uh, we can describe, the, the, the fact finder can understand the context and allegedly thereby assess accuracy in ways that may not be psychologically feasible. Uh, so there's much more that could be said about that, but that's at least uh, a brief response. Um, on why did I use fictions and should I use dogma or some other term, I'm open to the idea that it should be dogma. I don't think it should be error. I think it's, it's actually more complicated than, the, these aren't simply mistakes. These are foundational conceptions of what counts and how to assess, uh, how to make assessments that are, um, that are imperfect and flawed, but not simply mistakes. Um, and so I, I, I would reject, uh, I would reject the frame of error. Um, I think I was attracted to thinking about them as fictions because it invite. I think fictions can have truth to them as well as limitations of truth. And so I was attracted to a word that both suggested that they were. Um, that they that, that that they were warranted that they warranted being questioned, but that they also might in some instances be doing some productive work, even as they were um, uh, limited or imperfect. Um, but 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 dogma or some other um, uh, way of creating language to reflect that uh, that 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 blend of. Uh, of, of constructive imperfection and problematic imperfection at the same time, I would certainly be quite open to. So thank you for that. Now, I have uh, several words, uh, words asked and a few questions from the public, so I will ask you to be brief. Now, Amit Pandik. Thank you. Um, thank you for a fascinating question, um, a comment and a question. Um, a quick comment just to say that I found your point about the um, consistent with very important one. I mean, the fact that the accused has blue eyes is consistent with him being a serial murderer. Right. We would never admit that evidence, and nevertheless, scientists are allowed to use that language. So, I mean, I thank you for that. Um, my question is, is, is about the trying to explain or um, why so little has changed since 2009. And I wonder what you think about the following explanation. Um, it's not a justification, of course. Um, but the question is that maybe um, not much study is conducted into assessing the reliability of scientific evidence such as fingerprints and hair um, IDs, etc., uh, because we are afraid of finding out how unreliable it is, and since other types of evidence are even worse, then we might um, come to the conclusion that our ability to convict with confidence is so rare, only in few DNA cases, that the criminal system is just busy in self preservation, and that's the reason why the business um, continues as usual. So I wonder what you think about that conspiratorial explanation. Thank you. Thank you. I think that, I think that is plausible. I think that, um, sorry, I'm getting an echo, so I'll take those off. Um, I think that uh, there is a sense that if we did the studies for some of these areas, we would learn that they are significantly less perfect than they claim to be, but that they're actually relatively solid, right? That we would not learn that the error rates were so high that most of us would think that exclusion was the right remedy, that we would learn that these experts in many instances were able to make identifications with a um, relatively high degree of success. And so to exclude them feels like it's an excessive remedy, right? That it feels like it, it goes too far, especially as you suggest when we look at what other kinds of evidence like eyewitness identification evidence and ordinary testimony uh, we are admitting, and we think this might, in fact, be um, more accurate. The challenge is that 
because this was, these were developed by law enforcement for law enforcement, and because the courtroom is the ultimate space in which they operate, that if the courts won't insist upon um, requiring more, we're never really going to get more. So I mean, when you look at the history of the DNA wars in the United States, there was a brief period where a set of courts really did exclude the evidence. And that exclusion, that period of exclusion, where they said, my gosh, Life Codes is doing this worse than we thought. We don't really, we, we don't have confidence in the underlying uh, uh, genetic probabilities, we're not sure those were done right, we don't have a sense of whether the, the measures of what counts as a match are sufficiently objective. And so until you figure that out, we're going to exclude this. It actually provoked some really pretty meaningful work to improve what was going on in court. And so we have a bit of a tragedy here in the sense that if in 2011, if two years after the report, uh, the, the, the NIS report came out, or 2012, courts had begun to exclude, I have no doubt that by now, a decade later, we'd actually have some pretty strong studies, we'd know a lot more, and probably we would be using many of these forms of evidence in ways in which we could have more confidence. But because the courts won't do that, and because there aren't a lot of other incentives for the practitioners, most of whom are not, um, don't, aren't necessarily PhD scientists anyway, to go out and do this anyway, we, we, we end up in this sort of stalemate, which seems um, deeply unfortunate it from the perspective of trying to bring about justice. Professor Andres Paez. Hi, thank you for your talk. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I have three questions about cognitive bias. Um, you said in your talk that courts are somehow, they, they acknowledge the problem, but they, they are somehow dismissive of it. And uh, so I would like to know um, if there are any studies about judges' attitude towards cognitive bias, if there's any, any evidence for your claim to begin with. If, if, that, if, if it's true that the attitude is dismissive, um, maybe you could tell us why you think that is, why, why there is a resistance towards taking cognitive bias more seriously. And finally, the third question would be, what can we do about cognitive bias in the courts? Thank you. Thanks. Big, broad question. So there's, there hasn't been a great deal of work about judges' attitudes on this directly. Um, there's been a little bit. I mean, some of, uh, some of Jeff Klinsky's studies get at this. Uh, at least in part. Um, my claim comes from um, less direct surveys of judges to ask what they think and more what they do. That is to say, there are many um, cases in which it has been pointed out that, um, that the lab in question does not make any effort to protect examiners from knowing uh, domain irrelevant contextual information. And there isn't a single judge out there who has thought that that's a reason to exclude the conclusion, right? So, so um, it, 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 to be fair to the courts, that's one piece of information among many, right? But there aren't judges who are saying, wow, if they could, they could go about doing this in a way that would lead us to have more confidence at least in this dimension, and they're not doing so, ergo we, we, we're, we're not going to permit the, the evidence. So I can't speak to what's going on in the judge's head when they're making that determination. And you know, one of the, one of the structural problems here is that judges don't think it's their job to make decisions in a way that are going to sort of uh, support the, uh, the the sociologic economy, the the the, the broader uh, strength of the fields that are providing the evidentiary input. They view their job as simply to make an assessment using the standards available to them in the specific instance, right? Um, I mean, so somebody like Michael Reisinger talks a lot about the task at hand and how courts need to be focused in a very uh, limited way on the task at hand. And so you can understand or have some sympathy for the judge who might say, gee, I wish that this lab would 
protect against the inclusion of domain irrelevant information. It's a shame that they don't. But given everything, I believe that there's enough reason to believe that this evidence meets the standard that I'm supposed to apply, that I'm going to admit it. That judge might actually be, in some ways, relatively concerned about this problem of bias and yet not find that it rises to the level of warranting exclusion. Um, but, but systemically, if over and over, that's the conclusion that the judge comes to, um, then the labs don't have a lot of um, incentive to, uh, to, to take greater care vis-a-vis -vis this set of questions, at least for the purpose of improving their, uh, their, their chances of getting this kind of information admitted. So, I mean, I, I, I recognize that part of my, part of my structural frustration, I mean, that was sort of around the edges of the talk rather than at its center, is this problem that the courts view their task as, uh, as the particularized judgment in the, in the given instance, and the collection of those particularized judgments fails to create any space for uh, producing the dynamics that would lead to systemic improvement. Um, and I think that's, uh, I, I don't think that's a fiction, to go back to your question, but I do think it's a pathology. I think it's something that's pretty unfortunate. I will read one of the questions made in writing. It says, I'm sure you will agree with me that words must mean something and that words are never neutral. They are theoretically and institutionally loaded. In that sense, isn't it strange that and unwarranted to talk of forensic science, science emphasized, given the lack of a sufficiently reliable scientific basis in almost every forensic area? Would you agree with the suggestion to use the term criminalistics instead? This is the case in Germany, for example. Many thanks. It's a great point, yes. I mean, I think we could have a long debate about how we ought to define science, but uh, it, it, I, yes, it, there's no question but that uh, to use the term forensic science is to, in a sense, conclude that which has not been established and uh, to do uh, linguistic work that might not be completely warranted. Um, at the same time, in the United States setting, it can feel... Um, I, 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 pro, uh, provocative or disrespectful to refuse to use the category that's been widely used, um, even though I actually do agree with the thrust of the question that by most of the ways that we would want to define science, most of the pattern identification uh, uh, methodologies don't warrant the term. Very briefly, Carmen Vázquez, please. <laughs> Um, Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your presentation. It was so interesting. And I felt that somehow you were describing what happens also in our systems. Unfortunately, we have some of the same problems. I have two questions. First of all, I would like to know your opinion about all the mechanisms different from cross-examination in order to understand who, uh, for whoever has to take a decision, juror or mm, judge. In some cases, for instance, in Australia or in the United Kingdom, we have seen examples of how to. So there is this kind of meeting of experts in order to debate in front of the judge whenever someone does not agree and to take a decision based on that. In the United States, there were also some proposals so that jurors could access the expert report and they could better understand what will happen afterwards in the hearing. So I would like to know your opinion about these kind of tools or mechanisms or maybe you know about other examples so that we can try to foster the understanding of the jurors or the judges. This was the first question. Second one, also linked to jurors, judges. I would like to know if in the United States there is any experience about how to train judges, judiciary training uh, linked to expert evidence. In our systems, 
we normally say regarding jurors that we can train judges professionally so they can be more professional. But you were talking about the US experience and you were saying that maybe even if they are being trained and they have access to all this information which is really relevant about uh, accuracy and so on, things haven't changed that much. So I was wondering if you have any example of how to train judges, judiciary training, which can help us to improve via training. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for the, the terrific pair of questions. I'll take them in the reverse order. So on trainings, there have been lots of efforts to do some degree of training. It usually amounts to an hour here or there. I've done some of them. Some other people in the room have done some of them. And judges invariably say, wow, this is really interesting. I'm going to think about these cases differently. But then what they do in practice is um, maybe those judges are a little bit less likely to refuse to have a, a hearing. Maybe those judges are a little bit more likely to engage in some of the modest tweaks that I described, but I wouldn't say it's led to anything transformative. And part of that is probably because we're not giving them a, a clear pathway about even how to do that. So uh, I think there's been some effort, I mean, the, the, there's a, there, there's a, there have been some efforts to engage in judicial trainings around this, uh, but, but it hasn't led to anything that's terribly um, transformative. Um, on your first question, I think it's really interesting to ask, are there other mechanisms? So look, I'm in California, so of course I'm a fan of hot tubbing, right? Um, but, 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 but more seriously, I think that the, the idea that has been largely limited to civil cases, as I understand it, of bringing the experts together to uh, get them to talk and delineate more carefully their areas of agreement and disagreement are, I think that's an interesting phenomenon. In many of these, uh, of it, in most cases involving forensic science evidence, there may not be any defense expert at all. And if there is, it's probably not somebody who comes from the domain in question. So it could nonetheless be interesting to put them together, to put the fingerprint expert together with the critic of fingerprinting or the firearms expert together with the critic of firearms and see what that produces. I don't know of any place in the US where that has uh, occurred. Um, I've argued, I, I've suggested that one thing we could do, I mean, there is a real problem in that in many of these instances, there just isn't any defense expertise at all. And part of that is because indigent defendants don't have the funding for experts um, and don't really have access, depending on the particular public defender's office and what they are able to provide. I've suggested that we should create modular testimony. Much of the evidence in these cases isn't specific. It's not about whether these two prints match. It's about the lack of scientific foundation. And that's a, a repeat instance. That's the same, I mean, gradually over time, there might be more studies, but whatever somebody would say today isn't going to be any different than what they'd say tomorrow or next week. It changes only very gradually. And so I've argued that we ought to create a mechanism where uh, somebody authoritative produces uh, modular made in advance testimony, complete with made in advance cross-examination, that the defense could elect to use, that the defense could elect to insert it. Um, nobody likes this idea, not the prosecution, not the defense and not the judges, which actually makes me think I'm onto something, uh, but it doesn't fit very well within our um, individualized adversarial tradition and how we think evidence is supposed to be produced. Thank you. Juliana Amazoni. Thank you so much. Uh, it has been really, really insightful for me. I actually think I am the only psychologist in this, uh, in this auditorium here. And uh, I'm very glad to hear that, uh, actually I'm very non-glad to hear that other sciences are at an equal standing as psychology. And maybe in psychology we have done a lot of work that I'm very proud of, especially in eyewitness identification, et cetera, et cetera. That's been taken at least partly into account in the procedures that have, are used in the United States currently, and actually we are doing a little bit the same thing in Italy. I've moved to Italy uh, relatively recently. I have some issues uh, 
uh, well, thank you also for having uh, clarified to me the fact that one of the problems that I've always seen about expert witnesses in psychology is this partly legibility, and actually probably this uh, illusion of full legibility of what is done, because all of us can be psychologists. Well, it's absolutely not true, and I, have the t I take the chance of saying this publicly, even if I'm going to speak tomorrow morning for, for hours, so maybe the people who will be there will hear that loud and clearly. Uh, I have some issues with your point number 10. Compatibility cannot exclude, etc., etc., as an advancement. In my work as, a, as an expert witness, I've actually uh, fought against that very strongly because in psychology it is very, very easy to say it is compatible with. Well, everything is compatible with everything else. And so I think that it is logically a very, and epistemologically also, a very dangerous path to take. And I'd like that to be really erased from, <laughs> from the advances that you have claimed have been done. And thank you again for your talk. Thank you. That's a really important point. Yeah, so, you know, it's funny, in a world where, where uh, a set of critics, including me, think that the courts are too quick to admit evidence in much too strong a form. It can feel like an advance when a court's prepared to substantially restrict it. And it is an advance in the following sense. Many, uh, there are many opinions that find that forensic pattern evidence standing alone is sufficient to support of a conviction, right? That if you find a fingerprint in the right place at the right time, that that without more could support a conviction. And if you go back to just kind of class consistent with testimony, as a sufficiency matter, it's no longer sufficient. There's no question that if all you're allowing is consistent with testimony, that that cannot stand to support a conviction without a lot more. And so in that sense, it's walking back the evidence from a really strong form. But I actually share your concern. I think that while it seems to be an advance, it seems to be courts recognizing the weakness of the evidence, I think it's pretty dangerous. I think it's pretty dangerous in part because it's so meaningless. It's hard to understand understand what the jury is supposed to assess, uh, what, what they're supposed to take from it, and um, there's a risk that they hear it as being much more than is legitimate. So I mean, I, I guess I think it's an advance if it's, a, if, it's, if it's on the path toward exclusion until there's better science, but I don't think it should be a stable resting place. Make your question in 30 seconds. We have no, 30 seconds. No more. No more time. I'm sorry. And I apologize with the rest of the person who asked. We have no more time. Okay. Start the clock. Uh, thanks for your points. Um, I'm, uh, I think you made a lot of good points, but I'm a little worried that your approach leads to being overzealous in gatekeeping, especially framing it as, as fictions might lead to a situation where we exclude too much, exclude stuff that actually has a probative value. Maybe this is because I come from a system from Sweden that has free proof and handles this differently, but that's my worry. Maybe you could say something about that. Yeah. 30 seconds? That was great. I think it was under 30 seconds, and I'll try to do the same in answering, because I know we're short on time. I think it's a, I, I guess what I would say is I think it's a fair theoretical concern, but after watching in my country how courts are so incredibly reluctant to limit the testimony, much less exclude it, and given that I think that uh, unless there are significant restrictions, there's going to be very limited incentives to Im improve the underlying methodologies. It feels to me like more a theoretical problem than a practical one. Um, I, I, I do agree with you. So for example, one of the dilemmas with firearms testimony is probably an anxiety about having to go back to old cases and open them up um, if they relied in significant part on this form of proof. And a sense that it's valid and reliable enough that we don't want to have to face some kind of um, a backwards look at cases that have relied upon it um, in the way that we, we have uh, done to some degree with hair identification and bite marks. So it's, it's, it's a fair concern, and, um, but I, I guess I, I, I believe that there would be a pathway where um, the courts could uh, 
again, this gets back to the problem that they don't view this as their task, but if there even a way where judges were saying, this is weak, and if it isn't improved by the next time I hear it, I'm not going to allow it in. We need, we need the courts in some way to incentivize dramatic or meaningful change, or in my system, it's not going to happen. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you all very much. Thank <laughs> you.